is, uh, it was like going through the looking glass. You know, nothing was real, nothing was right. I was living in a madman's world. Hello, and welcome back to Lesser Known Monsters. I'm your host, Kip Evanson, and today's episode is, to say the least, disturbing. In Houston, Texas, during the early 70s, a man named Dean Coral sent an entire community of parents into an absolute panic when their young boys started disappearing one by one. The local police immediately considered all these young boys to be runaways, giving Coral free range to kill as he pleased. But... Dean Coral wasn't alone. He had two young accomplices, and they helped Dean create the havoc and chaos that was the Houston Mass Murders. On the morning of August 8, 1973, a patrolman was answering a call about a man that had been shot at 2020 Lamar Drive in Pasadena, Texas. When the patrolman arrived to the address, he saw three young kids, two boys and a girl, sitting on the front porch of the house, the female wrapped up in a blanket. When the officer asked the kids about the call, one of the boys stood up and said the occupant of the house was lying in the hallway inside and that he was dead. He also admitted that he is the one who shot him, and introduced himself as Elmer Wayne Henley Jr., and that the man inside was Dean Coral. The officer went inside the house and observed a man lying on the floor in the hallway. Blood smeared down the wall, and he appeared to be very much dead. He was completely nude and had bullet holes in his back. The officer checked the man's pulse. Nothing. He observed and recorded the gunshot wounds. One to the head two to the left shoulder, and three to the lower back. The officer called for backup and arrested the three kids for questioning back at the station. The stories they would soon get would leave them horrified, but not as horrified as they were about to be once Henley took them to Dean Coral's boat shed. Dean Coral was born on Christmas Eve in 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was the first child of Mary Robinson and Arnold Coral. For their whole childhood, it was just Dean and his younger brother. But the marriage between the two parents was turbulent. They had divorced at one point, only to remarry again a little later. Only to divorce permanently after that. But not before Arnold packed them all up and moved them to Pasadena, Texas. A short while after the final divorce, Mary met and married a traveling salesman who sold clocks for a living. His name was Jake West. In August of 1955, the couple had a daughter and named her Joyce. Although Dean was much older than his new baby sister, he loved her and helped take care of her. At this time, Dean was attending Vador High School, where he started realizing his homosexuality when he would date girls and never really felt attracted to them. But he was definitely attracted to the boys at his high school. This is something that Dean would keep secret from almost everyone in his life until the day of his death. His mother was strongly against homosexuality, and he never wanted her to know. In 1958, Dean Coral graduated from Vidora High School. Shortly after his graduation, his stepfather, Jake, brought home another traveling salesman who sold candy and was doing very well for himself. It was brought up during their conversation that the candy salesman was having a hard time finding stock on a certain candy, pecan chewies. Mary offered up her skills to make the product for the candy salesman. They were selling so well that Jake stopped selling clocks altogether and started selling strictly candy, naming the new business the Pecan Prince. They packed up and moved to Houston as that's where the candy sales were the highest. Jake's plan was to open up a new assembly line with a small retail store so he wouldn't have to go on the road anymore and could stay home and work in the shop with his wife and family. 
It was at this point that his family moved into the Houston neighborhood named Houston Heights, or just the Heights, as the locals called it. Jake and Mary set up a new shop in the area, hired some more employees, and began running a popular candy company. The first indication that something was amiss with Dean Coral was when a delivery boy that worked at the candy shop approached Mary about Dean, accusing Dean of unwanted sexual advances towards him, claiming that Dean grabbed his private area. This infuriated Mary, but not towards Dean. Her anger was at the delivery boy, who she instantly accused of lying, and he was immediately fired. Dean Coral was 22 at this point, and had been passing out free candy to the local children. The candy he would give away were the rejects, such as being misshapen, or the ones that just didn't come out right. It was still candy though, and the kids would flock there every day to receive their free goods and to mingle with Dean, who, at the time, children and parents alike viewed as an honest, kind, hardworking man who could be trusted around these children. He was soon known to the local kids in the Heights area as the Candyman. After Dean found out about the accusations against him with the delivery boy, which were true, Dean decided he needed a cover-up to convince his mother and Jake that he wasn't gay. Dean met a young lady while in Indiana taking care of his grandmother and began dating her there. She was so enamored by Dean that she actually proposed to him. An offer he turned down and left back to Houston. Now it was time to bring her back into his life. He needed a good cover after what had happened with the delivery boy. He called her up and asked her to move to Houston so they could be together, and Dean promised that he would try to make a life with her. This was all, of course, a ruse to keep suspicions of homosexuality away and to avoid any questioning, but she did end up moving to Houston to be with Dean and also became the new delivery girl for the candy company. Mary and Jake's marriage soon fell apart, although they did remain friends and the divorce was amicable. They even continued living in the same house with each other as to not to separate young Joyce from either parent. It was also at this time that Mary took her share of the profits from the Pecan Prince and opened her own shop, naming it the Coral Candy Company. Dean was appointed vice president of the company and his younger brother was appointed the secretary treasurer. They hired a few more employees and began their new business. They were operating within a month. Dean and his girlfriend moved into an apartment directly above the factory, and although there had been zero sexual contact between the two, they seemed to be happy and making it work. In March of 1964, Dean Coral announced to his mother that he would be joining the army. When asked about his girlfriend, Dean stated that they had discussed it and that she would wait for him. This was a lie. In reality, Dean was trying to get away from this fake relationship and all the lies, hoping that joining the army would give him this freedom. And within a few months, he was clocking in at the Fort Polk U.S. Army base. While in the army, Dean Coral had his very first intimate encounters with other men, all consensual at this point. Dean Coral, for a short time, thought he had found a place where he could actually be himself and stop the lies. But upon other recruits finding out about Dean's sexual orientation, he started getting not only bullied, but pummeled. The hard men of the army did not accept Dean at all once it came out that he was gay. Nevertheless, Dean's record in the army was spotless as a radio repairman, and he did an excellent job. Until one day when Dean decided that the army just wasn't working out for him after all. After 10 months of service, Dean put in a request for a hardship discharge, stating that his mother's candy company was suffering and that she needed him home to help save it. He was given an honorable discharge from the army on June 11, 1965. Upon arriving home, his family welcomed him back with open arms. He continued his role as vice president of the company, but while he was gone, Mary had purchased a different location for the shop and everything was being relocated, including Dean's apartment. Dean was unaware at the time exactly what he would be capable of doing in that new apartment in just a few short years. There was a patio in the back of the candy shop that Dean converted into a nice outdoor lounge area with a pool table and places to sit and a jukebox. Coral's Candy Company was located right across the street from an elementary school, so Dean's little hangout area became very popular very quickly, with kids by the dozen showing up every day after school for some free candy and a free game of pool. Dean enjoyed having the young kids around, and the parents all knew Dean as a kind, generous, and helpful person, so they never questioned it. Coral's Candy Company started doing so well that Dean was rarely needed around the factory. 
He decided to get a second job and he was soon employed as an electrician at the Houston Lighting and Power Company part-time where he would work mornings and during the afternoons he would run the candy company. Dean's girlfriend had broken up with him for another guy, something that didn't really bother him all that much. It was at this time that Dean met 12-year-old David Brooks, a boy Dean would befriend while outside the lounge area behind the candy company. Dean and David became good friends despite their tremendous age difference. David Brooks would later state that this was because Dean Coral was the only adult he had ever met that didn't make fun of him for his small size and his big glasses. They would spend time at the beach, go to movies, go fishing at Dean's stepdad's cabin, and Brooks spent a lot of time at Dean's house. It wasn't very long until Coral started making sexual advances towards David Brooks. By paying David money and buying him things, David would allow Coral to molest him. This allegedly happened to many young boys that came in contact with Coral around this time. Boys he saw grow from kids at the candy factory to young teenagers. This went on until September 1970. On the 25th of September, an 18-year-old named Jeffrey Conan was hitchhiking from the University of Texas in Austin where he was a freshman. Coral spotted him hitchhiking and offered him a ride. No one knows exactly how this went down because the only two people involved are now deceased. But police found Jeffrey's body during a search of the High Island Beach on August 10th, the location shown to them by David Brooks. His body was buried under a boulder, covered in lime and wrapped in plastic. He was nude, and his wrists and ankles were both bound with nylon cord. Though the neighborhood and his family spoke highly of Coral, he had, for some reason or another, decided that he wanted to be a murderer. Forensics determined that Jeffrey Conan had died from asphyxiation due to a gag that had been stuffed into his mouth and by strangulation. For a couple of months, David Brooks was absent while he spent time with an out-of-town parent. But when he returned that December, he walked in on something that would forever change the rest of his life. Coral had two boys strapped down to his bed. All three were naked. Brooks, having a key to the place and thinking he was welcome to walk in anytime he wanted, had walked in on Dean Coral sexually torturing these young boys. Dean turned and snapped at David, causing him to turn around and leave immediately. David later questioned Coral about what he had seen. Dean then made up an elaborate lie, stating that he was a member of a gay pornography ring and that those two boys were sent off to California to have pictures taken of them. Dean tried explaining to David that he was, quote, just having a little fun with them, unquote, and that they were alive and well in California. David had no reason not to believe Dean Corll at this point, but still found the news about what his friend was doing extremely unsettling. David never spoke a word about it, and in fact was offered a job opportunity. Dean Coral had told David Brooks that he would pay him $200 for every young man David could bring to him. David had also brought up that the police had already considered the other two boys that were missing runaways, fueling Coral with confidence. It is suspected that these two boys were Danny Yates and Jimmy Glass, both 14 years old. Glass and Yates were on their way to an anti-drug rally at their local church, the Evangelistic Temple. Jimmy Glass's brother had stated later that, quote, he saw them walk up an aisle as if they were going to the restroom, and that was it. They basically vanished into thin air, unquote. No one has been able to figure out exactly how Coral was able to lure these two boys to go with him. Yates's older sister has said that both her brother Danny and Jimmy had both talked about an older man who would take them to movies and offer them beer. The police had quickly swept this under the rug, insisting that the boys had run away and no further investigation was done. The police department had said at this time that unless there was clear evidence of foul play, there would be no further investigation into missing young boys. Also stating that there was evidence that a lot of kids from the area were running away to join the, quote, hippie movement. It was shortly after these murders that Dean had packed up and moved to the Place One Apartments on Mangum Road. And on January 30th, 1971, Dean Coral claimed his fourth and fifth victims, this time with the help of David Brooks. Looking to earn his $200 and still under the impression that anyone he brought over would be sent to California, David Brooks helped Dean Coral abduct two brothers on their way to the bowling alley. They were 15-year-old Donald Waldrop and 13-year-old Jerry Waldrop, using the ruse that they were invited to come have a party with all the beer and marijuana they could ever want. When they arrived at Dean's place, David introduced the boys. Dean then turned on some music and told the boys that they were going to play a game. 
He then handcuffed and tied Donald to a piece of plywood he had in his room. It was eight feet tall and about three feet wide and had holes drilled in each corner where boys could be handcuffed or tied to the board. Donald was tied to this board. Dean then handed Jerry a whip and told him to start whipping his brother. When Jerry protested and started crying, Dean grabbed him and handcuffed him to the board next to his brother, also tying his legs to the plywood by the ankles using nylon rope. David had walked into the room at this point and had seen how Dean was treating the two brothers. He has stated since that he was indeed horrified and was not expecting that again, but he was so drunk that he was able to tolerate it. Dean then beat the brothers mercilessly with the whip before sexually assaulting and strangling them both to death. David, in an extremely drunken state, had agreed to help Coral clean up and dispose of the bodies. They drove out to a rental boat shed and Dean opened up shed number 11 and told David to start digging. While they were digging, Dean told David Brooks that there was no pornography ring and that he had in fact killed the first two boys as well and they were also buried in the boat shed. David helped hoist the two new bodies, wrapped in plastic, into shallow graves on top of Danny Yates and Jimmy Glass. David Brooks has since said that the reason he didn't turn in Coral was because he was like a father figure to David, and he just didn't have the inner strength to turn him in. Soon after the murders, Dean Coral bought a used Corvette for David, possibly to make enticing young kids to go with him easier, perhaps to keep David's mouth shut, and perhaps both. In March of 1971, 15-year-old Randall Harvey was riding his bike when he was approached by David Brooks and Dean Coral in Dean's white van. David was friends with Randall from school, making approaching him easier. He introduced Randall to Dean and then invited him to come over for a, quote, big party with the promises of alcohol and marijuana. Randall initially turned down the offer because he actually had to work that night at a gas station in Oak Forest. But after some persuasion from David, and more than likely some cash offers from Dean, Randall gave in and climbed into Dean's van, throwing his bike into the back. Dean Coral had a sinister plan that he planned to utilize on Randall Harvey that night, and most of the subsequent victims. He used different methods to do this, but mostly he would have the victims write down their name and address and have them write a postcard to their parents saying that they had found another job in another city and did not come looking for them as they would be home soon. But for Randall, it went down a little differently. They had him sign a party guest list, as well as write a short message. He wrote, Randall Harvey, first one at the party. Thanks, Dean. Dean then offered to show Randall a party trick that he said Randall could use when other guests got there. Dean led Randall into his bedroom and with the promise of freeing him right away, Randall allowed Dean to handcuff his arms and legs to the plywood torture board thinking Dean was going to show him a trick. There was no trick, at least on anybody except poor Randall Harvey. Dean then took Polaroids of Harvey imprisoned on the board, sodomized him, and then killed Randall with a gunshot to the left eye. David was out in the living room the whole time, ignoring Randall's screams for help. It has been said that David actually turned the volume of the music up to drown out his screams. Dean Coral then took an orange comb from Randall's pocket, and along with the Polaroids he took, put them in one of his drawers. Then both David and Dean took the deceased boy, wrapped in plastic, and buried him and his bicycle in the boat shed. Dean then wrote a postcard mimicking Randall Harvey's handwriting from the message he wrote when first arriving to the party. He wrote it to Randall's parents, saying that he had found a job and left town. Randall Harvey wasn't identified until years after the case broke open. He was cremated and his ashes, along with his mother's, were scattered in Lake Livingston. The Houston Police Department once again claimed this was a runaway and no further investigation was done. Dean acted alone in the next two murders in May of 1971, which, of course, makes knowing exactly what went down impossible. The victims were 13-year-old David Hillegeist and 16-year-old Mally Winkle. What is known is that Winkle had actually worked at Coral's Candy Company at one point. It is also known that Mally made a quick phone call to his mother the night he disappeared, claiming he was going swimming at a beach in Freeport. What really happened was Dean Coral abducted the boys, most likely sexually assaulted both of them, and they were strangled. If what I have read on Mally is correct, there are sources saying that he was bashed in the back of the head with a blunt heavy object. 
As was the trend thus far, the police reported this as runaways and no further investigation was made. This did not sit well with neither of the boy's parents. The Hillegeis were planning on leaving for vacation the following day, and there was $20 sitting on David's dresser. David's parents, insistent that their son could not have run away, then drove out to the beach David claimed he was at and began showing his photo around, asking if anyone had seen him. Then Dorothy and Fred Hillegeist, along with Mrs. Winkle, printed out missing person flyers and offered $1,000 to anyone who had viable information. Dorothy Hillegeist even called the police once with information on the Corvette that David had been driving around, including the license plate number. The police failed to follow up on this lead that would have led them directly to Dean Coral, allowing him the freedom to claim more victims. Both boys were buried in the boat shed. One of the boys from the neighborhood would help post the missing person flyers around town. This boy was Elmer Wayne Henley. Mrs. Hillegeis said that Wayne Henley would help us deliver the posters. He was always helpful and very concerned, always asking about David. It was stated in the newspaper article about the missing boys that Elmer Wayne Henley was still out passing out the flyers. David Brooks saw this and had an idea. He knew Wayne Henley. David had not been able to procure any boys for Dean lately and decided that Henley would be his next target. On August 17, 1971, knowing that Henley would spend his Tuesday nights at the Heights Bioscope, a movie theater that would give school kids a nice discount on Tuesday nights, Brooks parked his green Corvette and waited for Henley to exit the theater. Wayne Henley never arrived, though. Instead, David Brooks saw a mutual friend of the two, Reuben Watson Hanny, strolling out of the theater by himself. David convinced Reuben to come over to Dean's house for a giant party. Reuben climbed into David Brooks' car. When they arrived at Coral's place, the host handed Reuben a beer. What Reuben obviously was unaware of was that his beer had been drugged. After a couple of laced drinks, Reuben Haney was completely unconscious. After unsuccessfully attempting to get Dean to call the ambulance for the unconscious young man, Dean refused and instead took Reuben into his room and tried sexually assaulting the boy, but was not able to as Reuben was completely out cold. This frustrated Dean, who just ended up strangling Reuben once he realized he wasn't getting anywhere. David and Dean took the body, wrapped it in plastic, and buried the body on the beach at High Island. A few weeks after killing Reuben, Dean moved into another apartment on Columbia Street in the Houston Heights area. It was September of 1971 when David showed up at Dean's new place with a new potential victim. This time, it was 14-year-old Elmer Wayne Henley, a tough kid who had an even tougher childhood. Abused by his father and the breadwinner for his house, Henley had a very adult outlook on life. He was arrogant, cocky, and street smart, and Dean Coral immediately liked him. He liked him so much that Dean decided pretty quickly that Henley would live. Not only that, but since David had recently gotten a girlfriend, he wasn't coming around as often, and Coral looked at this as an opportunity to reel in another accomplice. After getting to know Henley, Dean offered him the job. Dean lied to Henley the same way he lied to David and said it was a sex ring for young men, and Wayne would get $200 for every young boy that he could bring to Dean. After some questioning, Wayne told Dean he would think about it and Henley thought about it for roughly a year, he states in his confession letter, before he actually took any action. Although in most other accounts, it seems it was closer to five or six months that he actually got involved. It was February of 1972 when Wayne Henley decided he needed the money for his family and decided to bring a child to Dean and earn his $200. This was 17-year-old Willard Branch Jr., who was also called Rusty by his friends due to his red hair. Henley lured Rusty to Dean's place with the promise of smoking pot. It didn't take Dean long to lead Rusty into his bedroom, knock him out with a rag of formaldehyde, tie Rusty to his board, and do what he always did. This time though, castrating Rusty while he was still alive and then shooting him in the head with a 22, killing him. Wayne had left the house before Dean actually started in on Rusty right after he received his 200 bucks, so he saw none of this. On March 24, 1972, Dean Coral moved once again to a townhouse on a street called Schuler Street. Dean had invited David Brooks and Wayne Henley to a housewarming gathering, and while there, Wayne decided to go out and find a boy for Dean. 
He had chosen a close friend of his, 18-year-old Frank Aguirre, who was just getting off his shift at Long John Silver's restaurant. Frank had stated that he was going to visit his girlfriend Rhonda Williams. Henley offered to give his friend a ride as he knew who Rhonda was and where she lived. Frank agreed and climbed into the van with Wayne Henley. It was then that Wayne informed Frank that they were making a quick stop by Dean's place first. Frank, being the laid-back kid he was, agreed to that as well. After a night of drinking and smoking pot, Wayne wanted to show Dean his own methods of entrapment. He told Frank he wanted to show him a handcuff trick. Wayne handcuffed his own ankles and wrists together and covered himself with a blanket and then emerged from the blanket free of the cuffs. Frank, amazed, wanted to know how the trick was done and allowed his friend to cuff his hands and feet together. At this time, Wayne was still under the impression that these boys were going to California to be slaves in a pornography ring. But then Dean forcefully moved Frank into his bedroom, shocking Wayne. Henley asked David Brooks what was happening, and David told Wayne the truth, that there was no sex slave ring, and that Dean was going to kill his friend. Wayne then ran to Dean's room and pleaded on the other side of the locked bedroom door for Dean to let Frank go. But it didn't work. Dean Coral killed another young victim and made both David and Wayne help him dispose of the body. They covered it in lime, wrapped it in plastic, and loaded it into a wooden box. The body was buried at High Island Beach. 18-year-old Frank Aguirre was Dean Coral's 11th victim. When Dean got back home, he went through Frank's clothes that were left behind and found a notepad that had Frank's handwriting on it. Mimicking the handwriting, Dean wrote a postcard to Rhonda Williams explaining why he never showed up, a postcard she never received. 17-year-old Mark Scott was lured to Dean's house by Elmer Wayne Henley on April 21st, 1972. He was then tricked into playing the handcuff game. After being tricked into the handcuffs, Dean tried forcing Mark to write a message on a postcard to send to his parents to throw them off. When Mark refused, Dean started manhandling him and Mark pulled a knife on Dean. Even with the handcuffs on, Mark Scott was able to pull a knife from his jacket and slash at Dean, cutting him. The cut was superficial and Dean wasn't injured, but he was enraged. He went back at Mark again and again Mark started slashing his knife at Dean until out of nowhere, Wayne shouted for Mark to drop the knife. And when Mark looked over at Wayne, he was holding a gun to his face, telling him that if he didn't drop the knife, Wayne would kill him. Obviously scared, Mark dropped the knife and wrote the postcard, saying that he'd found a job and would be back home when he'd made enough money. After the postcard was written, Dean didn't bother with any of the sexual assaults or his torture board. Getting a knife pulled on him made Dean very angry and he killed Mark straight away. When Mark tried kicking his feet while being strangled, Henley held down his legs, actively participating in the murder. David Brooks just stood back and watched. After Mark Scott was deceased, his body was wrapped up and buried at High Island Beach. Dean mailed the postcard the following morning. When Mark's parents received the postcard, they immediately saw through it, knowing that it wasn't right. In a news interview, Mark Scott's mom had stated that, quote, he didn't even take his motorbike, a Honda C70, with him. That's not normal. We think our Mark was abducted by somebody. On May 21st, 1972, 16-year-old Johnny Ray DeLome and 17-year-old Billy Green Balch just finished getting their hair cut at a local barber shop. As they were leaving, they heard their names being called from the parking lot. They walked over to the van they were being summoned to, and they both recognized everyone in the van, which at this time were all three killers. Dean was driving, Dave was sitting in the passenger seat, and Wayne was in the back. They were lured to Dean's place with the promise of free marijuana. Within a couple of hours, both boys were tied to Dean's bed, naked and sobbing. Wayne walked in and started talking with Dean about what was going to happen, and Dean offered to let Wayne kill them both, an offer he took up. Wayne Henley not only killed both the boys, he killed them both at the same time. While he was strangling Billy Balch to death, Wayne took a 22 pistol from his waistband and said to Johnny DeLome, Hey Johnny! Causing him to look up, and Henley shot Johnny in the face, killing him. After cleaning up and loading the wrapped bodies into the wooden box, using a piece of paper found on Billy Balch that had his name and address on it, 
Dean forged another postcard, this time to Billy's dad. Dean drove 70 miles to Madisonville, Texas to send the postcard, which arrived to Mr. Balch a couple of days later. It stated that he and Johnny had found a job working for a trucker heading out to Washington and that he would be back in four weeks. The bodies were buried at High Island Beach. Things continued like this for the rest of the year and into the following year. At one point, the three guys got spooked while taking the bodies to the beach at High Island, nearly getting spotted by a patrol officer. This caused Dean to go back to the boat shed and rearrange his self-made graveyard as to fit more bodies in there. On July 20th, 1972, Stephen Sickman was 17 years old when he was abducted. He managed to punch Dean in the face, which obviously only enraged Dean more. He was beaten with a baseball bat on the torture board, strangled with a nylon cord, and his body was buried in the boat shed on Silver Bell Street. On August 17, 1972, 20-year-old Roy Bunton was on his way to work at Houston's Northwest Mall where he worked as a shoe salesman. He was abducted and kept alive on the torture board for four days before being shot in the head multiple times by Dean and buried in the boat shed. In Henley's confession, which I'll read to you in a bit, he stated that there was a boy that really upset Dean when he had to kill him because he really liked him. I believe Roy Bunton was that boy. On October 3, 1972, 15-year-old Wally J. Simonu and 14-year-old Richard Hembry were walking home from a movie. They had stopped to admire David's Corvette and David struck up a conversation with the kids, offering them a ride. Coral had moved into Westcott Towers by this point, and David told the boys he needed to stop off there really quick. While they were there, Wally tried using the phone to call his mother without Dean's knowledge. But when David found him talking on the phone, he ripped the phone cord from the wall. The only word he was able to get out to his mother was, Mama. The two boys ended up on the torture rack with gags in their mouths, molested for a large portion of the night, and then left there while Wayne, Dean, and David went out to a club. They were left tied up all night long. In the morning, Wayne Henley shot Richard in the mouth, failing to kill him. Dean then strangled him. Wally was also strangled. They were buried in the boat shed that night. On November 15th, Dean, on his own this time, abducted and killed 19-year-old Richard Kepner, who was on his way to a phone booth to call his fiance. Very little is known about what happened to Kepner. His remains remained unidentified for 11 years. After moving yet again, on February 1st, 1973, Joseph Lyles showed up unexpectedly at the new place looking for David. Although David was nowhere around and Dean wasn't expecting him, Dean told Joseph that he'd be back soon and offered him a beer and a place to wait for David. While there, Dean made some sexual advances towards Joseph and Joseph was able to bite Dean's hand. This caused Dean to punch the boy in the face so hard that he fell backwards, hitting his head on a tree and splitting open his skull. When David did show up a few hours later, the body was already wrapped in plastic. Dean wanted to take the body and bury it at Jefferson County Beach. David helped bury the body. He would not be discovered until 1983 and not identified until 2009. In June 1973, Dean had again moved to his final residence at 2020 Lamar Drive in Pasadena, Texas. On June 7th, Wayne showed up to Dean's new place with 15-year-old Billy Ray Lawrence. They lied to Lawrence, telling him that they were going fishing in the morning and they invited him along, which he agreed to. They then fed him alcohol laced with pills until he was unconscious. He woke up the next day tied to a bed, naked, with Dean instructing him to write a letter on a postcard. And after he finished writing the letter, Dean would let him go. But, of course, that didn't happen. Instead, Billy Ray was kept alive for three days, getting sexually assaulted and tortured, and eventually strangled, and then buried in Lake San Rayburn the next day. On June 15, 1973, 20-year-old Raymond Blackburn was murdered as well. Raymond was in town working on a large project in the Heights and was actually from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Raymond had received a call from his wife back home that she had just given birth to their first child. 
he decided to hitchhike back to LA to see his newborn baby. Unfortunately, he was picked up by Dean Coral, who took the man to 2020 Lamar Drive, where he was murdered and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn, where it was now a sure thing that Raymond Blackburn would never get a chance to meet his newborn baby. Dean Coral committed this crime on his own, so very little else is known. On July 7, 1973, Wayne Henley lured 15-year-old Homer Garcia to Dean's place by giving Garcia a ride on his motorcycle. They were getting ready to set off fireworks for a late 4th of July celebration. This intrigued and thrilled Garcia as he'd never lit off fireworks himself before. He'd only seen them from a distance. His family was never able to afford fireworks. The three killers allowed Homer Garcia to light off all the fireworks, giving Homer a false sense of friendship. After letting him set off all the fireworks, the trio brought him into the house and filled him up with liquor and weed. At one point, Garcia had spotted the large wooden box the trio used to carry bodies. When he asked what it was for, Wayne showed Homer the handcuff trick. And under an hour later, Dean had shot Homer through his lung with his 22, following an intense beating in his bathroom. Garcia was begging for his life and for them to call a doctor, only to have Dean shoot Homer Garcia in the forehead, causing him to fall backwards into the tub. He was left there to bleed out, and then buried at Lake Sam Rayburn.